Have you ever considered the influencers in your life? Maybe friends that you spend time with, the family that you grew up with or that you spent time with over the holiday season, or maybe it's what you watch or what you listen. Well, recently I was thinking back on what I listened to and how country music has affected my life. Now you're all laughing at me, but it has influenced me to drive my truck, live in the country, no dog. <laughs> my wife wanted, I wanted a dog, my wife wanted a cat, so we settled with a baby. So <laughs> the third thing it influenced me to do is go fishing. Now, for some of you, you're laughing in here because you're like, yes, I can't believe that he loves country music. For the rest of you, you're like judging me because I listen to country music. <laughs> and we're going to invite you to the tables of communion in a little bit, and you can confess your sins uh, there. <laughs> but in our passage this morning, we are going to see negative influences and positive influences. The negative influences draw us away from our relationship with Christ, our positive influences draw us closer to our relationship with Christ. And so with that, let's look at Psalm chapter 1. In verse 1, we see three negative influences. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. The first negative influence he, we see here is that you walk in the counsel of the wicked. This word wicked means to be guilty, to be in the wrong it could be you're in the wrong because you've wronged God, or it could be you're in the wrong because you've wronged another person. And all of a sudden, what begins to happen is you begin to trust that person. You start to spend time with them. You start confiding in them, and they become your counselor. And he said that this is a negative influence for you or I to participate in. Notice what he says next. Nor stands in the way of sinners. This is not just talking about every single person who is born a sinner, because all of us are, but it's talking about somebody who willfully chooses to disobey God's word. They know what God's word is, says, and they willfully choose to go against it. Uh, this, this is where they, this becomes the driving influence in your life or in my life. Somebody who is drawing us away on purpose from our relationship with God, and we know it, and we're okay with it. That's what he's talking about here. The third negative influence he gives is nor sits in the seat of scoffers. A scoffer is somebody who mocks God or mocks God's people. And it takes it one step further because it's not just that uh, you are observing somebody mocking, but you're starting to join in in mocking God's people or mocking God himself. Right after Thanksgiving, I did a wedding uh, just outside of Elmira area, outside of uh, the lake right over there. And... As I'm getting ready, I show up at 2.40, wedding starts at 3, and I'm hanging out with the groom, and they're running behind, which is pretty common for weddings. And uh, there was this guy who was there, one of the groom's buddies, who think obnoxious frat boy. And he begins to look at me and say, what did you do, go online to get some certificate to do this wedding? I said, no, actually, I do pastor at a church. And he goes, I don't like pastors, I only like priests. I was like, okay. And uh, so then he goes, what do you have to do? Uh, go to school to learn some Latin? And I said, no, I didn't learn Latin. I didn't have the heart to tell him that the New Testament isn't written in Latin. It's actually written in Greek. Um, <laughs> but I was trying to preserve this time and make this uh, a semi-normal event for this groom. And uh, then he goes up and says, I'd go to church every Sunday if we went back to pre-Vatican days. And I'm like, well, what happened during the pre-Vatican days that would make you want to go to church? He said, they burned witches at the stake. Would you burn a witch? I said, absolutely not. How about an adulterer or adulteress? Nope, definitely not. He goes, then I wouldn't go to your church. And he kept using other explicit language to try and get under my skin. Well, it's after three o'clock. I'm like, when is this wedding going to start? <laughs> I'm tired of this guy. And uh, all of a sudden, the bartender comes over and tells all the groomsmen and uh, the groom that, hey, I can serve you some drinks. And this guy, who's obnoxious, orders this amber ale, and he takes a big chug of it and starts choking on it. And I walked over to him as he catches his breath, and I patted him on the shoulder and said, I remember my first drink, and walked away. <laughs> That's probably not very Christ-like. 
But he respected me and uh, respected Christ from then on out for the rest of that time. <laughs> Notice the next progression. Now, I, like I said, that's not Christ-like, so you can forgive me for that. But notice the next progression we see. It says he walks, he stands, he sits. There is a progression where the intensity of influence continues to grow. Warren Wiersbe says this, if you follow the wrong counsel, then you will stand with the wrong companion and finally sit with the wrong crowd. I'll read that again. If you follow the wrong counsel, then you will stand with the wrong companion and finally sit with the wrong crowd. To give you a little illustration of this, turn with me to Genesis chapter 13, where we see the story of Abram and Lot. Genesis chapter 13. I'll give you a little backstory as you're turning there. Abram and Lot are related, and their possessions are growing immensely. And so they have to decide that they're going to part their ways and occupy different territories of land so that they make room for all of their livestock. And this is what Lot chooses, verse 10 of chapter 13 of Genesis. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So he looks with his eyes. He doesn't just look and look away, but he's gazing at it. He's desiring it. And, and this was a very um, contrary to what God would want his people to live like in Sodom. And all of a sudden, he's desiring it, and he's looking towards it, and he's gazing to it. Fast forward, verse 12 says this. Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled among the cities in the, of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. So now he doesn't just gaze at it and look at it. He moves his tent and pitches his tent right outside the city. So at night, he could go into the city, live his lifestyle that he wanted to live, and then uh, everybody else wakes up, and he's living outside of the city, and that's how he wants people to perceive him, that he's living right in God's sight. Look with me at chapter 14, verse 12. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions. Now he's not just outside the city, but now he's living in the midst of people. They're starting to influence the way that he lives, the way that he talks, the way that he interacts with people. He's engulfed in this type of lifestyle. This is the progression that Psalms chapter 1 is talking about. He goes from walking to standing to sitting. As you look back on 2018 at the influencers in your life, Are they leading you towards Christ, or are they leading you away from Christ? Are you engulfed in the lifestyle of sin? Are you participating in mocking God and his people? Or are you slowly outside the city limits, like flirting with it, going in it every so often, then coming to church on Sunday, and living this half-in, half-out lifestyle? But there's good news for you. There's a positive influence that can have on your life and my life. Turn back with me to Psalms chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. So those were the three negative influences. Now let's see two positive influences. Verse 2 says this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The first positive influence we see here is he delights in God's word. He delights in it. It means that he has pleasure towards it. He desires it. It matters to him. That that it's something that he finds pleasure in more than the almond roca that you ate or the fudge that you ate for the holidays, that this desire to spend time in God's word. It, It matters to you, so you prioritize it. You put it above the game. You put it above your hobbies. You put it above uh your social media or your your platforms that you're spending time on that could be distracting you from delighting in God's word. And if you are struggling to spend time in God's word and delight in God's word, then the first step is that you pray for God to give you a hunger and thirst for righteousness. You begin to pour out your heart, God, I want to spend time in your word. I desire it. Help me to prioritize it. And what you'll see is he'll begin to wake you up early in the morning or he'll uh, your, the Spirit of God will prompt you at night to spend time reading God's Word and spending time with Him in a relationship with Him. 
For others of you, you've been reading God's Word on a regular basis, but it's not a delight, it's a duty. Where it's just a thing that you do week in and week out, day in and day out, where you come here, but it's not a delight, it's not a pleasure, it's not something that you desire. Our delight starts with knowing God, but it climaxes in our obedience to God. It starts with us knowing God, studying God's word, uh, memorizing God's word, but if we don't climax at the obedience of God's word, then we're not moving forward. We're not building a relationship with Jesus, we're building a religious pursuit. And so if you're struggling with this, then start putting obedience in your life. As you look back on this last year, could you see growth that has taken place in your attitude, in your behavior, in in your desire, in the way that you interact with your spouse or your kids or your coworkers? Is there forward progress in your relationship with Christ? The second positive influence that he gives here is he says, on his law, he meditates day and night. The second positive influence is meditating on God's Word. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says that meditation is a command, which means that it's not going to be natural for you, and it's not going to be uh, natural for me. It's something that we have to work at. It's something that we have to put into practice. It's something that we have to develop the discipline to do. And there's two definitions that are given for this word because it's used over a hundred times in the book of Psalms alone. The first definition is to think about or to speak means to fill your mind. Eastern religion says you empty your mind. Here God's word tells us that we are to fill his mind or fill our minds with his word. And what happens if we begin to fill our minds with his word as we think about it, as we begin to ponder it, as we begin to speak it out into the context of life that we live, what happens is it doesn't give any room for insecurities to come in and we begin to doubt the gifts that God gives us. It doesn't give a lot of room for temptation to be birthed and to to begin to take footholds in our minds and our hearts because we've meditated on God's word and the temptations are able to be put away. As we think about God's word, bitterness and resentment and uh, greed and lust are put away with because as we meditate on God's word and we fill our minds with God's word, uh, love is developed and contentment is developed and forgiveness is established as we spend time in God's Word. And as you begin to think about God's Word, you begin to meditate on God's Word, what begins to happen is it starts to influence the way that you communicate to your spouse. More kindness, more grace, more love. It begins to influence the way that you communicate to your kids, less condescending and more encouraging. It begins to influence the way that you interact with your coworkers or your neighbors. Your words become more bridges to the gospel and less barriers to people coming to know Jesus. The second definition for this word meditate is to regurgitate. I know that's not a very appealing word uh, in this definition of meditate. But the word regurgitate also could mean to chew the cud. Okay, definitely not appeasing anymore. But there are certain animals that are able to chew the cud, and a goat is one of them. So as I was studying this passage yesterday, I began to do a little research on goats so that we could further understand this idea of chewing the cud or regurgitating. So here are two fun facts about goats. Number one, goats chew their cud eight hours a day. Eight hours a day, they're chewing their cud, they're, they're regurgitating, they're bringing it back in, and they're chewing on it. They're regurgitating, they're meditating upon it. When was the last time you or I meditated upon God's word for eight hours? Meditating on the financial difficulties you're in because you just survived Christmas? Yes, for eight hours. Meditating upon the maybe diagnosis of an illness? Yes. But meditating and pondering and thinking about God's word and bringing that into your life and my life on a regular basis from how it affects the minutes that we live and the hours that we live and the whole day. When was the last time you and I meditated upon God's word and chewed the cud for eight hours? The second fun fact to know about a goat is you can tell how healthy a goat is by how well they chew the cud. So, how well they regurgitate 
tells you how healthy that goat is because as they regurgitate it, they develop a better uh, or a more healthy digestive system. What if we measured the health of our walk with Christ by how well we meditated upon his word? Would we be healthy or would we be anemic? Because if we're anemic, then there's areas to grow and there's areas for us to begin to become more and more healthy. And if you are struggling to become more and more healthy, then I invite you, sign up for discipleship, which is a one-on-one mentorship available to men and women to be able to invest in you and hold you accountable in the next season of your life to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We have it one-on-one, and then halfway through January, we're going to start group discipleship available for men and available for women, and we encourage you to do that. And if you're struggling to delight in God's Word, then sign up for the hermeneutics class that Steve just talked about, January 20th. It's a Sunday afternoon from 2 to 6, where we're going to talk about how to study God's Word and how to gain a lot of uh, knowledge, but then apply it into obedience into your life and my life. And we encourage you to do that. So your positive influence is to delight in God's Word and to meditate upon God's Word. But turn with me to Psalm chapter 119, because I didn't want to end there. I want you to see 10 reasons on why you should delight and meditate upon God's Word. We're going to go through this quite rapidly, but if you're not convinced to spend time in God's Word in 2019, then turn with me to Psalm chapter 119, and we're going to see 10 reasons why you and I should delight and meditate on God's Word. It's a few pages to your right says this in verse 9. Number one, it purifies us. Verse 9, it purifies us. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. By spending time in God's word, by studying God's word, what begins to happen is it influences and purifies and cleanses your thought life. It purifies and cleanses your motives and desires in your heart and in my heart. And all of a sudden, we are on this journey of purification because of spending time in God's Word. Number two, it keeps us from sin. Verse 11, I have stored up your Word in my heart that I may not sin against you. It keeps us from sin. It keeps us from going back into old lifestyles before we knew Christ. It begins to affect the way that you and I live, and we have a less of a desire to head back into old lifestyles or old struggles because the Word of God begins to take root in our heart, and it shows us the emptiness that those sinful behaviors have. Number three, it strengthens us. Verse 28, my soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. It means that he, he feels like he's melting away at the affliction and the sorrow and the challenges that he's facing, and it, he's telling us that it strengthened him. It took him from weakness to strength as he began to incorporate the disciplines of spending time in God's Word. Number four, it comforts us. Verse 50, it comforts us. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. He found comfort in his affliction because he spent time in God's Word and was reminded of the promises that God's Word gives. When you are being afflicted, God's Word becomes the blanket which surrounds you and comforts you in your time of need. Number five, it guides us, 105. It guides us in verse 105. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Do you need guidance in 2019? I do. And the way that a lamp worked in this day and age is is the lamp would light one step in front and required you and I to walk by faith. As one light, as the light comes on, we know the next step we're to take. But that happens as we spend time in God's Word and God begins to reveal His will for your life. If you want to know what God's will for your life is, it's your sanctification. It's you growing in your relationship with God. Number six, it upholds us. Verse 116, it upholds us. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live, and let, there not be, let me not be put to shame in my hope. It upholds him. The promises of God prevented him from stumbling and falling, and it, the promises of God that he found in his word were able to hold him up and help him move forward in his life. Number seven, it directs us, verse 133, it directs us. 
Keep steady my steps according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. It, it, it gave him direction. It firmed up his steps. He knew where he was going because he spent time with God in his word, and therefore you and I should spend time in God's word, delighting in it, meditating upon it, because through that steadies our steps and find, we find direction. Number eight, it gives us hope, 147. It gives us hope. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your word. The more our society moves away from morals, the more complex people's lives get, and the more they realize the depravity of sin, which means that we have an opportunity to bring in the hope of Jesus. And maybe you're here and you feel the weight of sin, the guilt and the shame that's going on in that, and we have good news for you because the Bible provides you with hope for that. The Bible provides you with an opportunity to feel loved and cared for and begin this journey of finding healing. You can find hope in God's Word in 2019 by delighting and meditating in it. Number nine, it redeems us, 154. It redeems us. 154 says this, plead my cause and redeem me, give me life according to your promise. This idea of redemption is is that he's pulling you out of the slavery of sin, and as we spend time in God's Word, it's pulling you and I out of old lifestyles, that as you spend time in God's Word, as you read God's Word, what you begin to learn is that there's parts of your life that there's deep pain and there's deep hurt that's come in, and Christ wants to come in and redeem your life. There are areas where it's not gift-wrapped very pretty. There's areas in my life that aren't gift-wrapped very pretty. But Christ, by His Spirit, wants to come in and say, you know what, I want to heal that. And as healing takes place, intimacy for, for Christ increases. And then God says, I want to be able to use you to be my hands and feet so that you can go out and help other people find redemption in what I've done. Number 10, number 10, it's what we rejoice in, 162. It's what we rejoice in. 162 says this, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. He's rejoicing it because what is found in God's word is God's plan for you and I to be saved. Ever since the first man sinned and everybody else is born into sin, there has been a plan for God to send his son into the world to save you and I. And in it, we can rejoice because we have been found forgiveness. In it, we can find God's grace and mercy and God's plan for you and I as we spend time in God's word. That's why you should spend time in God's word. That's why I should prioritize it. That's why I should delight in it. That's why you should meditate upon God's word. Turn back with me to Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. He closes out our passage that we're going to talk about this morning with an illustration. He gives you and I an illustration. He says this, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. He gives this picture of a tree that's planted by rivers. And in our area where we live, trees don't have to be planted by rivers to bear fruit. We have enough rainfall to take care of that. But what, in their dry and arid climate, if a tree wasn't planted next to a river, it wouldn't get enough water in the summer months to be able to produce the fruit in its season. And so, what do you think the most important part of a tree is? It's not what you see, it's its root system. Because at the root system provide, is where it absorbs the nutrients from the soil to be able to bear the fruit that that tree wants to produce. What do you think the most important part of your life and my life are? Our root system. Our spiritual root system, which provides us with the nutrients to be able to bear fruit for Christ in his name. The root system of a tree allows the tree to be able to withstand the winter storms. If it has a deep root system, when the wind storms come or the rain hits, it's able to withstand it and it's not able to fall over. If we don't have deep root systems, 
founded upon our relationship with God. When the winter seasons of life come, we're going to fall over. If we're not meditating and prioritizing and memorizing and thinking about God's Word on a regular basis. But notice what he says next. Planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. When the tree is planted, it doesn't bear fruit right away. It takes time for it to bear fruit. Now, I love peach trees. Love them. And uh, I think probably once every week or every other week from June to September, I'm going out to Deering Orchards and I'm, I'm picking peaches, okay? I have peaches in my breakfast. I have peaches that I incorporate in my lunch. If I'm really feeling it, I may even bring in peaches for dessert. Now, what I've quickly realized is can I eat fresh peaches year-round? No, I can't. Why? Because... All year long, they're being watered, they're being cared for, they're being taken care of. And if I was to go out to Deering Orchards right now, those trees wouldn't be bearing any peaches. Because they spend 10 plus months with work being involved, absorbing nutrients, going through the winter, and at the end of the year, as You know, June kicks around, the early peaches come on, and then as the summer continues on, the sweeter peaches come on, and those are really good. But it's it's through that time that the fruit is begins to be cultivated and developed. Which means that you and I can have the discipline of meditating on God's word, delighting in God's word, thinking about God's word, speaking out God's word and contextualizing it into the lives that we live. And there's going to be seasons in your life and in my life that we're not bearing fruit. Because it's not till the harvest season comes that fruit is established. And I want to encourage you, if you've been spending time in God's Word, to persevere and to endure. Because it's through that process that you begin to cultivate and are able to bear fruit. The other thing notice is it says, in its season, it bears fruit, which some of us are brand new to walking with Jesus, and we're like, we're used to Amazon Prime. We get it in two days or less. And all of a sudden, we spend two days in God's Word. We've thought about it. We've meditated on it for five minutes or ten minutes, and we're like, where's the fruit? And it takes a little bit more time for you and I to be able to go down this journey. It takes time to cultivate a heart that is desiring and delighting in God's Word and to prioritize those things. And over time, growth takes place that as you look back over a year, you can see the fruit that has taken place in your life. And as you look back on this year to come, as you get into December next year, you are able to see the growth that's taken place in your life. And I can see that growth taking place in my life. And we want to encourage you this year in 2019 to meditate upon God's Word and to read God's Word And what we did was we put together a reading plan. We do this every year, and we invite our church to join in with us where we pick certain books of the Bible that we believe are foundational to your walk with Christ, and we want you to join with us. Chances are if you came in, you got one of these, and I want to quickly go through this and kind of walk through the different months with you. So this month, starting in two days, we are going to be reading the book of John in January. The book of John is all about Jesus being portrayed as the Son of God. Every other gospel portrays him differently, but here we see that Jesus is portrayed as the Son of God. We see it in chapter 1 where he says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Word is, is Jesus. Then we see it where Jesus himself calls himself God. We see it where the religious leaders wanted to take up stones to stone him because they, he called himself God. And so you're going to see that. If you're wrestling with who Jesus is, then I invite you to read this book. In February, we get into Romans, which is a detailed exposition of the gospel and what we believe and what Jesus has done for you and I. In March, we get into the book of Jonah, which is all about God's will unfolding in his life. And guess what? He doesn't do a good job of it, of being obedient. He actually finds himself in the belly of a fish. Now, I don't know how that's physically possible, but he does. And God gives him a second chance to go back to the people of Nineveh and to fulfill the God's plan for his life. In April, we got it, we're getting into the book of Psalms, which is 
a book all about poetry and, and articulating God's truths in a poetic and song-like way. As you read through the book of Psalms, you'll see certain phrases that are commonly found in the songs that we sing today. And I've yet to find anybody who doesn't like music. So if you, don't, if, if you do not like music, then I want to meet you. But chances are you like some form of music, and so you'll like this book and spend time in it. We do the first 50 psalms that are given there in April. In May, we get into First and Second Peter, where we start learning about suffering and how to deal with life uh, in the midst of trials and persecution. And so we find encouragement with that in May. In June, we go back to Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, where we see the creation take place, the creation of man takes place, the creation of women takes place, the creation of nations takes place, the creation of different languages takes place, and we get to see the foundation laid there. Then in July, we go to the next book in the Bible, which is Exodus, which is the nation of Israel has been in slavery for 400 years, and it's the process God takes them on to redeem them out of physical slavery through Moses' leadership. And then in August, we go back to Psalms, and we go to chapter 15 through 50, sorry, 51 through 100 in August. In September, we get into First and Second Thessalonians, which is all about the second coming of Christ, which provides us with hope that Jesus isn't just going to leave us here to fend for ourselves, but he's coming back, and he has work for us to do between here and now, and, but we have this hope that he's coming back. In October, we have Daniel, which is a book taking place while the nation of Israel is in exile under the Babylonian exile, and we begin to see stories unfold about how Daniel and his friends stand up for what they believe in in the face of opposition, so much so that they're thrown in lion's dens, they're thrown into fiery furnaces, and God provides for them and delivers them, and then we get a little bit about the end times at the end of Daniel. In November, we go back to Psalms uh, 101 through 150, which over half of them are Thanksgiving songs or, or, or gratitude, which kind of ushers us and launches us into the Thanksgiving season. And then in December, we go into First and Second Timothy, where these are called the pastoral epistles, where God begins to instruct how the church is to function and what the church is to be about and how leaders are chosen and elders and deacons, and, and all of this is found in how the church should function, and we want to kick off and end the year with First and Second Timothy. So we invite you, if you're an adult here, to, to join in this reading plan with us, to spend time in God's Word. And we're going to frequently remind you about what book we're reading uh, once a month or so uh, by the different uh, platforms that we have, such as our eWeekly or social media or uh, here on Gatherings. But a couple weeks ago, it's probably end of October, I was reading a book on parenting. And there was a statistic that was given to parents about parents that struck me that I want to talk to you about for parents or grandparents in here. In a recent study, Barna reported that fewer than one out of 10 born-again families read the Bible together during a typical week. Less than one in 10. So let's say we have 150 families here at Ecclesia between grandparents, and families. That means less than 15 of us are actually reading the Bible to our kids or our grandkids on a weekly basis. And so I want to encourage us as parents that, or grandparents that when your kids or grandkids are with you to, to prioritize spending time in God's Word. And you can do it in four ways. One, get some good tools. And I want, we want to be a church that provides you with good tools, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute. But number two, make it fun. Make it fun. It doesn't have to be boring. Like with Griffin right now, we're like, every time he sees a donkey, we're like, what does the donkey say? Every time he sees a sheep, what does the sheep say? Well, he's two years old, so he wants to tell us what those animals, what their noises are. And make it fun. Keep it short. It doesn't have to be more than five or ten minutes. If you have young kids, they're not going to stay focused for longer than five to ten minutes. And number four, plan it. Usually, probably schedule it around bedtime because that's the most convenient time, at least for my family, and we encourage you to do that. But we want to provide you guys with resources as parents. And so what we did was we ordered some books that we felt like were really important for families of our church to spend time with their kids or their grandkids reading. And we broke them up by age groups. So less than two years old, two years old to kindergarten, and then kindergarten to fifth grade. 
And we believe that these resources will help equip and shape your kids to follow Jesus in years to come. But the important thing is, is we're going to provide you with the tools, but you've got to put it into practice. And so I want to highlight some of these books. We're going to have them for sale at the book table. We're selling them at cost. We're not trying to make money on them. Uh, we just want to put resources in your guys' hands. So Younger Than Two Years Old, The Biggest Story, ABCs by Kevin D. Young. It's got some great illustrations in here, and it uses the, a, the alphabet to give the whole overview of the Bible. And it's a way for your kids to begin to learn about significant things going on in God's Word, from creation to what happens in Egypt, to the prophets, to the historical books, to Jesus, to the new heavens and the new earth. And this is a great read for your kids to be able to understand and grow in their relationship with Jesus. And so this is one that we encourage you to pick up. If your kids are two to kindergarten, the Big Picture Story Bible is a great book. We encourage you to pick this up. Uh, it's 26 chapters, so if, uh, and it's not very long. It takes five minutes to get through, and it's a great way to start teaching your kids about who Jesus is and the Bible and put this in a regular practice in you. Uh, and there's 26 chapters that are major uh, topics that take place in the Bible, and it's a great opportunity for your kids to begin to learn God's Word. And you'd be shocked as you spend time in God's Word with your kids of what they're able to retain and what they're able to do. A couple weeks ago, we were reading the story of Lazarus in this book to Griffin, and all of a sudden, as we wrapped it up, he says, Lazarus, come out! <laughs> He's running through the house. Lazarus, come out! Because it's, we're spending time in God's Word, and He begins to do it. The other night, we got home late from a, a Christmas party, and uh, it's like 8.45, and he goes, where's my Bible? And Morgan's like, you got to go to bed, kid. Like, <laughs> Bible time tomorrow. But he, he's asking for it, and if you make this a regular practice, your kids are going to desire it, which means that when it's their own will, they're going to want to spend time in it. Then if you have kids older than kindergarten, we encourage you, the Jesus Story Bible is a great book for them to begin to read and grow in their relationship with Jesus. As they begin to learn how to read, then guess what? Have them read it to you because it becomes a normal practice in their life. We want to encourage you as a church, if you are a parent or grandparent here, prioritize spending time in God's Word, regularly spending time with them. And as you do that, you're going to see transformation take place because they're going to be listening and obedient to the things that God desires for them. Because the, the word, the, there's a promise given that says that when God's word goes forth, that it won't return void. And it doesn't matter if they're like two years old, that as these truths begin to resonate in their heart, they begin to be obedient to those things, and maybe years down the road, some verse or some truth comes into their mind, and they're reminded of it when they're not with you, and they're encouraged to live in that way. Whether you're an adult, or you're a parent, or you're a grandparent, we encourage you to delight in God's Word and meditate upon God's Word in 2019. Let's pray.